Hello, everybody. It's so great to be here. I, I feel like uh, I have uh, given birth to an elephant, and this is the uh, coming out party, so it's very exciting for me, and I'm really grateful that so many um, friends and colleagues have shown up. I particularly um, want to thank Brookings um, and especially the Governance Studies Program, uh, where I've been a guest scholar for the past three plus years, and also Brookings Publishing, um, who have published uh, this book. I'd also especially like to thank my co-author, Matt Muspratt, who has traveled from Kigali, Rwanda, uh, to be with us just for today. This book is about suggesting a major change in American foreign policy. To some, it is obvious, and to others, it, I hope, will be so once you stop to think about it. The fact is, it isn't happening now. And the it is entrepreneurship used as a tool in the service of foreign policy. Today's presentation is organized much as the book is. Um, there are basically uh, two main parts to the book, the description of the problem and the solution of the problem. And they're divided in turn into uh, these, these uh, subcategories. I'd like to start, though, just by way of introduction to explain um, how it is I come to write this book. It's a very personal book in a way. Um, in that uh, it, it grows from my personal experience. Um, I am uh, the son of Holocaust survivors. I was born in Budapest in 1954. Um, and uh, my family, um, including my mother, who I'm happy to say is here with us today, um, escaped from Hungary uh, during the Hungarian Revolution in 1956 and came to the US. That background has colored much of my life and my thinking because it has made it very personal for me um, what happens when the political order breaks down and when uh, there is a meltdown in civil society. And that uh, visceral personal fear of that has driven much of what I've done even though um, most of my career was spent in the private sector. Um, I spent 30 plus years as a business person, um, starting on Wall Street, spending some time in management consulting at McKinsey, um, several startups, most of which were um, uh, entirely unsuccessful, uh, but one was hugely successful, which uh, I'm happy to say is now the largest commercial television satellite system in the world called SES. It's based in the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, and it distributes most of the cable TV channels outside the US, like Al Jazeera or CNN or MTV. It's about a 20 billion market cap company and has uh, 52 satellites with 6,200 channels of audio, video, and data. I also spent a decade at Warner Brothers where I was um, corporate senior vice president for strategy and then eventually head of the operating committee. Once I retired is, is, is sort of when I had a new career in the public sector and came to Washington um, uh, at the beginning of the Obama administration and went to work um, as a Franklin Fellow, which is a program they have for, I euphemistically call it, bringing old people into the State Department. It's people with 20 or more years of non-government experience. And you come uh, with, a, with a specific project and a specific goal. And, and mine was entrepreneurship. And what motivated it was President Obama's Cairo speech in June of 2009 uh, at Cairo University, where he talked about using America's entrepreneurship know-how and credentials uh, as a way to help uh, Muslim countries, mostly Arab countries, um, uh, deal with their, their uh, horrific youth unemployment rates. And in fact, um, I have always felt that um, uh, the, 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 the most identifiable single issue that contributes to the breakdown of the political order is joblessness. And when you look back at um, many examples in history of this, you will find this is a constant theme that's repeated everywhere. In Germany, for example, in the interwar years in 1932, joblessness reached a high of 24%. 
And as you'll see in the presentation today, uh, it's much worse than that. Um, in many parts of the world. So I see a direct line connection between entrepreneurship, job creation, stability, and peace, which is why um, the book is called Peace Through Entrepreneurship. To begin, it's probably helpful to define some, some key terms, of which the most obvious is what is entrepreneurship and what is an entrepreneur. To me, an entrepreneur is a person with the vision to see a new product or process and the ability to make it happen. And this is actually uh, a more subtle definition than it may seem at first glance. For instance, I talk about a product or process, which means that I'm very focused on what I call no-tech, low-tech, and high-tech entrepreneurship. In the United States, we tend to equate entrepreneurship with tech. Um, and certainly that's where the most, the most of the headlines are. That's, those are the most astounding examples. But the fact of the matter is that there are plenty of no-tech or low-tech examples of entrepreneurship, and particularly in the developing world. So one common example I cite is the story of quinoa, uh, a centuries-old grain that was eaten by the Incas in, uh, in uh, Peru and Bolivia. It was a very small business, $35, $40 million. Today, it's almost a $3 billion business. Same quinoa. The difference has been in marketing and packaging and logistics to be able to distribute it to a much, obviously, to a larger um, part of the world. So no tech, which would be an agricultural product, low tech, which would be a basic technology that's not, it's in and of itself proprietary, for example, e-commerce, applied to a new area, or high tech, which is a general, genuinely new intellectual property, are all aspects of entrepreneurship that we need to, to focus on. And it is not just about products, but it also is about process. So again, by way of, of, of example, Starbucks didn't invent coffee, but it did invent a new way to sell coffee. And actually, there are more people who work for uh, Starbucks in Silicon Valley than there are who work for Google in the entire world. So when you, you look at job-creating uh, entrepreneurial ventures, very often it is the no-tech and low-tech ventures that create the most jobs. They're not necessarily the highest value jobs, but they are the most jobs. Um, so it's very important to, to, to make that distinction. And then the second part of the definition is uh, the ability to make it happen. And this is critically important, and I learned uh, that it, how important it really was when I came to work um, at the State Department. There's a saying in the startup world, it's 5% inspiration, 95% perspiration. And it really means what most venture capitalists and successful angel investors have learned, that it's rarely about the idea, it's usually about the execution of the idea. And so um, to translate that into public policy, um, it's rarely about figuring out why entrepreneurship is important, which I hope by the end of this presentation uh, to convince you of, but rather how to implement that policy, how to execute that policy. And what I have found is that in government particularly, the articulation of the policy is relatively simple. The execution is um, where the, uh, the rubber meets the road. So um, in our um, world, uh, entrepreneurs are rock stars. Um, they're the most important people who, um, you know, who are celebrities today, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Oprah Winfrey, fighter pilots. They're w w what many people want to emulate. In fact, there are some people who even pay students to drop out of prestigious graduate schools to start a new business because that's considered so much cooler than, uh, than, than staying in school. In the world uh, that I work in of, um, of uh, developing countries, entrepreneurs are very different. Entrepreneurs are the seedlings that grow up between the cracks in the pavement, uh, pushing their way through all of the detritus and the broken glass and the garbage that is accumulated, and despite all of the hardship, um, succeed. And that's a very different uh, kind of prism through which um, to look at this. And it's an important difference that colors 
um, the work that uh, I, I have done before and the work that I still do through my consulting firm, which works in entrepreneurship ecosystem development in emerging markets. So why, in fact, do I say that entrepreneurship should be such an important part of American foreign policy? Well, in my book, there's a chapter that's called A Million Reasons Entrepreneurship is Good for You. And don't worry, I'm not going to do a million reasons. Um, however, um, there are uh, a, um, what I call a baker's dozen. Um, and I am going to talk about a few of those. Uh, obviously, um, the single most important one is jobs, and we'll come back to that. Um, but as you can see from this list, um, there are a whole bunch of other reasons um, why entrepreneurship is, is also important. It is, for example, the essential bridge over which innovation is commercialized. Um, it is one of the biggest drivers of uh, regulatory reform. And um, it is also uh, a huge uh, driver of, of demand-driven development that's responsive to the market. But I am going to drill down on a few of them. And obviously, the first one is joblessness. And um, that's, that's really key. Um, for many people, and, in, and according to a great deal of research, uh, much of which I, I, I quote in my book, um, joblessness really is the root cause of um, extremism, and um, the extremism that uh, increasingly is the single biggest threat to American security, which is why the book is called um, Investing in a Startup Culture for Security and Development, because it really has a security element as well that we don't always um, think about. In the Middle East, um, you know, we have uh, record high rates of um, youth unemployment and the population is disproportionately young. Um, I, I have added uh, Molenbeek, the Brussels suburb where the uh, bombers who tried to, uh, who attacked the Brussels airport came from to this graph to show you that you don't need to be in the Arab world to have the, um, the, 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 the harm, the fallout that comes from these high unemployment rates because Molenbeek has an unemployment rate that's in the same range as uh, the Arab countries. Um, so uh, there, there is an enormous um, and, and fairly clear uh, connection between joblessness and um, violence. A couple of my, my uh, real heroes in, in this space, one of them, Ahmed Al-Alfi, who's an, an Egyptian-American, uh, very successful entrepreneur and investor, and as far as I'm concerned, is probably single-handedly um, had done more to improve the, the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Egypt, which is one of the primary countries I worked in, um, than anything else. You know, he, he, he's, he's, he's made it very clear that people have to have a reason, um, a positive reason, not a negative reason, uh, to do something. And uh, Hernando de Soto, sim similarly, um, famous Peruvian development economist, um, has, has observed that it is not actually... Um, uh, as often uh, political differences, religious differences um, that lead to the kind of violence that plagues the world as it is simply economic desperation and uh, the, 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 the despair that comes from uh, no hope of ever being able to have a job. So joblessness is, is clearly the number one most important reason, but there are, there are others too. The two that I learned a lot about while I was working at the State Department were first working for Secretary Clinton. I, I developed a, a very keen sense of, um, of the importance of women in the economy and how uh, especially disproportionately uh, beneficial it was when you help women and girls in terms of improving the state of, of, of the overall economy. And in point of fact, entrepreneurship is very often one of the only uh, opportunities to get a leg up that, um, that is open to women, girls, or others not born to privilege. Um, so entrepreneurship is particularly important when it comes to women's empowerment in the developing world. 
Another thing that was fascinating to me and that Under Secretary Sonnenshine, uh, as well as Ambassador Hume, who are here, will we'll be able to attest to, is the role of um, the class of people who are entrepreneurs. It's fascinating to me, but entrepreneurs are basically the same person everywhere in the world. Um, uh, whether you are in uh, you know, Joplin or Jakarta or Boston or Bombay, they're the same person. And, and it, I, this was brought home to me by the fact that um, during my time at the State Department, there were um, eight countries I worked in primarily, three where we launched the Global Entrepreneurship Program with full-blown permanent offices and staff and regular um, monthly programming. Those were Egypt, Indonesia, and Turkey in that order. And then five where we had partial versions of the program, some elements, which were Lebanon, Jordan, Algeria, Tunisia, and Morocco. So all of them were Muslim countries and most of them were in the Arab world. When I started doing this work, I uh, had never been to a Muslim country. I'm basically a nice Jewish boy from Los Angeles and I had never spent any time there. Um, but I was very open uh, with the people I met in saying that, you know, I am a nice Jewish boy from Los Angeles. I did live in Israel for a year. And um, the reaction that I got almost universally, particularly from the neighboring countries, Lebanon, Jordan, West Bank, Egypt, was, you know, could you possibly invite us to Washington to an event with Israeli entrepreneurs and venture capital so we can get to know them because we can see the startup nation from where we stand, but we can't actually talk to them. And it was so interesting to me because they almost never talked about anything having to do with politics, including, by the way, US policy in the Middle East. They were interested in building their businesses and they knew that one of the most successful uh, entrepreneurial economies in the world was within earshot. So this notion that it's a bridge um, class of people, I think, is terribly important from a diplomatic standpoint, which, as I said, Under Secretary Sonnenshine and uh, Ambassador Hume are likely to talk about. The fact is that um, uh, we, it works. Uh, we know that the places that have uh, adopted the promotion of entrepreneurship as a key element of their economic development policy have been successful. One of my favorite examples is to compare Singapore and Jamaica, uh, which I think is just fascinating. Uh, in 1965, they were both um, almost identical. They were English-speaking, former British colonies, exactly the same size in area, in population, and almost identical per capita income in 1965. Look at where they are today. You can't, you can't even compare them. I won't say that entrepreneurship was the only thing that explains this meteoric success in Singapore. Of course not. This is a social science, and it's impossible to show direct cause and effect between any two single factors. But it is more than coincidental, in my view, that um, promoting entrepreneurship was central uh, to the plan of the government of Singapore, that Singapore was governed, um, some would say, overly tightly, but certainly very efficiently uh, for a number of years, for most of the period that I just described, uh, which is absolutely not the case in um, Jamaica. And so, um, as Josh Lerner, the famous development economist at Harvard, um, has noted, it's, it's hard not to give some credit to that when we look at the explanation for what was the economic miracle. Um, another uh, good example that's um, very close to our uh, heart, uh, Matt actually lives in Rwanda, is Rwanda. Rwanda, uh, after the genocide, which was about 20 years ago, was arguably one of the most devastated countries in the history of the world. Um, the average age in Rwanda was 12. 70% um, of the men between the ages of 18 and 30 were dead. 65% of the women were HIV positive, infected. And there were two medical doctors in Rwanda. Since then, Rwanda has had the greatest increase in its per capita income of any country in sub-Saharan Africa, 52 countries. And not surprisingly, um, central to the development strategy of Rwanda has been the promotion of entrepreneurship. 
In fact, it's been so central that improving the business climate, which is one of the most important things and frankly one of the most um, indispensable things uh, to changing, to moving the, the dial in entrepreneurship, um, the government of Rwanda enjoyed uh, the greatest improvement in its World Bank doing business ranking of any country since the World Bank has begun uh, keeping uh, these rankings. It went from 143 to 67 in 2008-2009. So um, here is an example of a country that has uh, really come from the very deepest depths of despair um, and, and has made just an extraordinary comeback, which should give all of us who are interested in fragile and failed states a sense of optimism uh, about what can happen. Of course, one of my favorite reasons why entrepreneurship should be part of American foreign policy is because it's about as American as, you know, apple pie. Most people around the world, when they think of America, yes, they think of movies and music, um, but they also think of entrepreneurship. And in fact, it is one of the most admired features of American life. Um, and even those who, in many parts of the world, hate us the most, which unfortunately is a growing list of people, even those people are interested to know, how do we do it? What's the secret sauce behind that American entrepreneurial miracle? So it is an asset that is available to us. It's an arrow in our quiver that we haven't been using. Here's how much we haven't been using it. What is America doing now? Well, first of all, we spend 1% of 1% uh, of our sort of foreign assistance writ large on entrepreneurship development. Um, it, is, it is almost so small an amount of money that in the scheme of the federal budget, it's, it's virtually impossible to calculate. And we went to considerable efforts um, doing, in the course of doing the book to do that using OECD data. Um, so that it was able to be compared with other countries uh, against whom we also do very poorly. Um, such entrepreneurial powerhouses as Netherlands and Sweden um, spend uh, a, a greater percentage of their uh, aid on entrepreneurship than do we. In fact, the United States is pretty much tied with Australia, which has 23 million people, which is an island nation, which is, I jokingly say, 15 hours from anywhere, and which has 1 15th the population of the United States and 1 20th the economy. That's, that's the league we're in. Uh, we, America, built by entrepreneurs, where entrepreneurship is what drives our economy and it's something we're enormously proud of. What's worse is the money that we do spend, we spend poorly. Um, Entrepreneurship programs are scattered uh, across dozens of agencies. Um, there are 12 departments, 20 agencies, um, and 60 offices that have something to do with entrepreneurship. The office that I started and ran, the Global Entrepreneurship Program at the State Department, which is now headed by Tom Lurston, who I'm pleased has joined us here today, and which was started by another colleague of mine who's also here with us today, an exemplary foreign officer, Sue Sarnio, um, who, was, who was in the Bureau, Economics Bureau, when I uh, was struggling to start this, this program. Um, that is a, a minute, almost um, uh, infinitesimal uh, drop in the bucket. And by the way, GEP did not have direct funding when I was there, nor does it today. So we, it still has zero budget, direct budget. What we were able to accomplish was by using funds from other agencies um, and from other parts of the State Department. When we do fund entrepreneurship, how well do we do at funding it? Not very well. USAID is by far and away the US government agency that provides the most funding for entrepreneurship. And uh, the way that USAID works or doesn't work Josh Lerner's Boulevard of Broken Dreams is a good um, uh, example of that. A third of all USAID funding is, goes to just three firms. 75% of all USAID funding goes to uh, the, uh, 20 firms. And virtually none 
of uh, the, the, the people who work in innovation and entrepreneurship um, who are new to the game are uh, a actually able to participate. I have a consulting firm, um, which in full disclosure, I, sh I actually should have said right at the beginning, I work for a number of funders, development agencies, and others. I, I don't bid for USAID work. So we have the problem that I call turning a screw with a rubber screwdriver. We have the policy. Everyone talks about the policy. All of us who have worked in government have written talking points for everyone from the president to the secretary of state to every undersecretary, assistant secretary, deputy assistant secretary, ambassador on down. They're all the same talking points. Sometimes the data is refreshed, but even that is hard to do using the State Department's IT system. But but none of them actually result in functioning programs. So it's why I call turning a screw with a rubber screwdriver. It is almost impossible to connect the dots and achieve what it is that we are trying to do. Um, and one of the reasons is because so much of the work of government is today done by outside contractors. Uh, depending on which numbers you use, some number north of 50% of all US government programs are delivered by outside contractors. In some cases, like USAID, 100% are delivered by outside contractors. The agency has essentially no uh, program officers who actually deliver programs on the ground anymore. The US government spends over $500 billion a year on outside contractors, making it by far and away the largest customer in the United States. And um, so the way in which these uh, contracts are awarded uh, the procurement process, while not a very sexy subject, um, is extremely important. And um, I uh, think it is, is especially relevant when we talk about startups because in the world of startups and innovation, it's very, very difficult for new, young, entrepreneurial companies to get contracts. It's what I call the mouse and the hippo dancing with each other problem. Um, a, a small startup is never going to be able to even understand the bidding procedures, much less complete the bid, much less win the contract, much less meet the reporting requirements once they do. Which is why, as I wrote in a Brookings blog some time ago, in the case of healthcare.gov, the company that won the contract to program healthcare.gov, which by the way, as somebody who ran an IT company once, um, is, is not a hugely complicated issue. I mean, FedEx's tracking system does more on an average Tuesday than healthcare.gov does uh, in the 20 questions you have to answer. But the fact is that um, uh, the entire bold, audacious uh, reform plan, regardless of whether you think it's the right policy, the wrong policy, it certainly is bold and audacious, was almost torpedoed because the website didn't work. And why didn't the website work? Because the contractor who was selected to program the website was expert at winning federal contracts. By the way, it was not even a US company, it was a Canadian company. But uh, they'd never actually programmed a website like this. But that was not relevant in making the decision of who you pick because they did all of the other things that were required in the contract except know how to program the website. That's what I mean about the mouse and the hippo dancing with each other, it makes it very difficult. So what should we be doing? Well, I believe that entrepreneurship development is one of those few things in the world that is actually influenceable. Um, you can turn that one scraggly uh, scrub into a garden. Um, and unlike most things in international politics uh, that are intractable issues, centuries old, uh, animosities, religious and ethnic hatred, battles over land and increasingly water. Entrepreneurship is actually something we can do something about and it doesn't even cost all that much money. Um, and by the way, we're experts. The particular method that I um, use is something I've developed called the six plus six model for entrepreneurship ecosystem building. And the basic premise is simple. There's no one magic bullet. There's no one single thing you do to move the needle in entrepreneurship development. Rather, it's a combination of things. So it's not about just starting a venture fund or just building a business incubator or just hosting a business plan competition. It's about a combination of things. There are six categories of activity. Identify, train, connect, and sustain, fund, enable public policy, and celebrate entrepreneurs. 
and six categories of players, corporations, foundations, universities, NGOs, investors, and government, who must be woven together through specific programs that uh, move the needle. And um, what, what, the way that I work in, in, in the consulting work that I do is, is in a three-step process uh, where we first uh, diagnose an ecosystem, then design a, uh, a program to bolster that ecosystem, and finally uh, implement that program. Uh, this is an, an example of a diagnostic that we did for Ghana and the entrepreneurial ecosystem of Ghana, which was about three years ago, right, Matt? Um, and, um, but, 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 but the diagnostic exercise and the methodology that I've described are universal. So the analogy I use is it's a little bit like being a doctor. Every human being on Earth has exactly the same biology, physiology, anatomy, chemistry. Everyone who goes to medical school learns, better or worse, the same facts. The remedies that are available to solve a problem are also relatively standard, particularly in industrialized countries where they're all available. What is different is the actual treatment regimen that is recommended for any specific patient. So someone who has exactly the same problem, medical problem, is likely to be treated differently than someone else based on a whole bunch of other factors that are unique to them. So creating programs to bolster entrepreneurship is a bespoke trade. It's a customized trade, and you have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we know that entrepreneurship is good, and we know that America could do this, but why should America do this? Well, I'm uh, you know, of that generation that are Trekkies, and so I, I, my answer is because it is the role of government to do what needs to be done in a society and what no other aspect of society will do. So I think, for example, to the Marshall Plan. Uh, the investment and the return on that investment from the Marshall Plan were very widely spaced in time. Huge amounts of capital required with a 15, 20, 30, 50-year time horizon vision. Private investors who are looking at quarterly returns are not likely to make those kinds of investments. Yet having made those investments, the United States, both politically but especially economically, has reaped benefits that are unimaginable. They have given us the most, uh, the highest standard of living in the history of humanity. And that is primarily because we rehabilitated Europe and Japan after the war, and the sum of the parts was much greater after we did that. And I use the same analogy in entrepreneurship development. One of the other million reasons entrepreneurship is good for you is that everyone makes money. And the biggest benefits of the startups that are successful in developing countries will be to those who invest in them. And if we aren't among that group, then we're not participating in that. So I believe there are a lot of reasons why the government, in particular the US government, needs to be involved. Uh, to close, there are four main areas in which we need to change what we do. Funding, organization, procurement, and people. Um, first, we have to spend more money. Uh, second, we have to spend it smarter by organizing ourselves uh, in, a, in, a, in a more rational, business-like fashion. Uh, third, we have to reform procurement and contracting mechanisms, at least as relates to entrepreneurship and innovation. I, I am not here to argue that we revamp all of uh, the procurement and contracting of the entire U.S. government. I had the pleasure of taking a course on um, the uh, way that the U.S. government buys uh, goods and services uh, far. Uh, uh, it's a, it, the foreign acqui uh, federal acquisition regulations. There are 54 volumes of the FAR. Each has 2,000 pages, and they are the thickness of the phone book, if you remember phone books, those of you who are old enough to remember phone books. Um, so uh, it's very unlikely that anybody who, is not, who does not make a career out of federal contracting can be successful in uh, federal contracting. And last, um, I genuinely believe, deep down in my kishkis, as we say in Yiddish, that 
you have to have people, at least some people, who have experience as entrepreneurs. There is a general view in the State Department that disdains subject matter experts because everyone is supposed to be a generalist. And if it's Tuesday, I'm a consular officer in Brussels. And if it's Thursday, I'm on the desk in Baghdad. And I'm you know, universally trained and universally applicable. As a business person, that's absurd. You would never in a million years hire somebody for a responsible position who hadn't had experience in that particular line of work. At Warner Brothers, you're not going to give somebody the budget authority over a, a $200 million picture uh, because last week they worked on an animated strip that was worth $5 million. So how, how different could it be? It's totally different. Um, we, I know this is an alien concept in government, but expertise matters, experience matters, and we don't have America's best working on some of America's biggest problems, in my humble opinion. So that is the end of what the presentation is about. I want to ask at this point um, um, uh, Ambassador Hume and Undersecretary Sunshine to, to, to come and sit up on the dais, and while they're doing that, I'm going to tell you how amazing they are. Um, Tara Sonnenshine is uh, a former Shapiro Fellow and Distinguished Fellow at George Washington University School of Media and Public Affairs. She's uh, Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy, uh, which is the capacity in which we work together. She was uh, Executive Vice President of the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, she uh, served in the Clinton administration in several capacities um, at the White House. She was an editorial producer of ABC. She's a career journalist um, and a reporter for... Um, uh, Nightline, um, and uh, she holds 10 News Emmy Awards for coverage of international affairs. Um, she is also a, uh, a proud alum, as am I, of uh, Tufts University. Cameron Hume is one of the Foreign Service's most distinguished uh, uh, career uh, senior ambassadors. Um, he retired after uh, over 40 years uh, in the Foreign Service. He served as um, he served in posts in Italy, Tunisia, Syria, Lebanon, the United Nations, and the Holy See. He was ambassador to Algeria, to South Africa, and charge in Sudan. Though I met him working on the Global Entrepreneurship Program in Indonesia, um, in which he was uh, an, one of the the few and and strongest um, supporters. Um, he's been a fellow or guest scholar at the Council on Foreign Relations, the Harvard Center for International Affairs, the U.S. Institute of Peace. He's a lawyer admitted to practice in New York and D.C. and now teaches at Georgetown. Ambassador Hume is a graduate of Princeton and the American University School of Law. What do you guys think? <laughs> There's an open-ended question. Um, can you hear me? Because... Um, yeah, good, I see head shaking. Firstly, a round of applause for a very inspiring and enlightening presentation. I have two or three additions or building upon what was said today. And that is first, I'm going to just throw out some interesting things that the ambassador and all of you can weigh in on. There are some bad people in the world who might have seen this presentation because they're working off it. And I'm talking about extremists. And I'm speaking about groups like ISIS. Just because you have bad intentions does not mean you don't know how to be entrepreneurial. And we best get our entrepreneurial act together if we're going to do things like counter violent extremism. Because these groups know how to give away money, how to recruit, and how to be flexible and adaptable. So there is a national security reason that we have to get this right. So I want to throw that in the mix and ask the ambassador to comment on it. The second thing is the tech, high tech, low tech, I want to mention a sector that I believe needs and can do peace through entrepreneurship, and it's the media communications 
information sector. I see colleagues of mine, um, Anthony Garrett at Internews. These are organizations that are building radio stations, television stations, internet capability in societies that would be dark without that entrepreneurial light. And we have to fund that stuff. We can't complain about the media if we're not going to fund entrepreneurs who are journalists, investigative reporters, or media communicators. So I want to put that in your basket. And the third is international education and exchange, which is part of the work I was doing at the State Department. If we don't create the hybrid cross-cultural engagement, we will be siloed. I mean, entrepreneurship works because there's an ecosystem. And because it's not owned by one agency or one person or one entity, it is fundamentally about teamwork. And unless we are going to create those cross-cultural mechanisms, I think we will deprive ourselves of the oxygen that you need to make this system work. So I turn to my colleague to see if any of those rattle around in your brain. Uh, there's a lot of rattling. I'm one of those, <laughs> one of those State Department generalists the that rattlers. Steve talked about. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think we, as you started out, Tara, I think we have reason to fear. The, the, the situation that Steve points about unemployment is likely to get worse. It's not going to get better. You look at uh, the situ situations of societies in stress, for example, in Africa, uh, Niger, a case in point, the median age is 15. Now, that implies no matter what happens, you're going to have a lot more people living in Niger. And it's going to be a Niger which is hotter. And it's going to be a Niger which is under greater water stress with a population three or four times that of today. And people don't sit still. Some do, but many others hitch a ride on a truck and they go to the coast of Libya or Algeria and they, they try and find their future. Today, they're f trying to find their future in Italy or Spain. But don't think for a minute that they won't look for a future in Florida. This is these are just things that are happening, and we know from the international system today that while we can make it difficult for people to cross borders, it's impossible, at least for states in the West, to truly control their borders. We don't have the will to shoot people crossing borders. We don't. I'm not saying we should. Nor should we necessarily want to. And this is one last point to build on that. And Stephen mentioned in, in the presentation how much people want to come to America to avail themselves of the spirit of entrepreneurship. One quick story, Pakistan. As an undersecretary, you're sent, I was sent to Lahore to convince people or persuade them of our good American values and our foreign policy. And the young people were very hostile to an undersecretary in Lahore when I got there. And in the Q&A, just like this, you, I said, I want to take questions. The embassy said, please don't. I said, I came to take questions. I didn't fly here to give a speech. I could have done that on Skype. I came to engage with people. I want to take questions. People got up to the microphone, and they asked, why do you send drones over our country? Second question, why did you come in here looking for bin Laden? We don't go to Chicago looking for your mobsters. Why did Ray Davis a contract? It went on and on and on. And the embassy was trying to yank me out of there. And then I said, well, I'll stay behind and talk to students one-on-one. -on -one. Made them hysterical, the embassy, which is absolutely hysterical. And a line formed around the room. And quietly, young Pakistani students from Kinard College in Lahore whispered a question. 
How do I get on one of those Fulbright programs? Or how do I get to one of those Peace Tech camps? How do I get to one of your universities? Do not for a minute underestimate the magnet and the magnitude of that spirit. And I think you were trying to say we are underutilizing it. Ambassador Hume, can you talk, since we worked together a little on, in Indonesia as a, as a case study, as an example, and since you have really a, an extraordinary depth of experience in, in the department, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about realistic going forward solutions. Well, uh, first I'd say when you look at most of the countries you're talking about, they went, since becoming independent, they were, initially they were more or less Praetorian states militaries controlled them, the, the government was the main investment vehicle. Today they're what I'd call gatekeeper states. Egypt is an example where the economy has largely been privatized, but the habits don't change. And for the entrepreneur, they, they can't crack through and get access to credit, so they grow from being a firm with five people to being a firm with 20 people. And all of the things that you need to create that entrepreneurial society also create the society with rule of law, with jobs, with opportunity, exactly the things that the undersecretary mentioned is things that people find appealing about our own country. So the, the need and the possibility is there. I think what happens in, uh, often in government, and I know there are lots of people here today who work in this environment, and I'm not and not being accusatory, but my experience was people would say, we have a problem, do you know how to solve it? And you'd look, go out, you'd look at the environment you work in, you'd go back and say, look, this is something we can do. It's not gonna cost any more money. We'll get the results you want. I'd say, well, we can't do that. Well, why can't we do it? Well, we didn't do it last year. And those of you who work in government know I'm not making that up. And Somehow it is beaten into the minds of people, you can't find the opportunity. And it's not true. Things do change, particularly when they get bad enough. And the problems that are going to be caused by people, particularly in, the, in the, the North Africa through Southwest Asia part of the world, by not having jobs, those problems are going to get worse. And the change is going to have to come. Fortunately, we have things we could use as, as a society if we sort of buckled it up a little bit. But I want to give you a positive on this. And, and credit to President Obama on one aspect of this. The annual, we have to do something every year. The Global Entrepreneurship Summit, since the Cairo speech in 2009, has taken place every year. And we can argue whether the White House is the best home for it, whether it really is anything more than a talk shop in Tunisia or Stanford. But I must say, that is leadership. That is taking ownership of something. So I don't want us to throw out all the bad. Well, absolutely. And, and I, as you know, I, I helped plan the first one. And um, we launched the Global Entrepreneurship Program at the first one. And so you're right, it is, the government is great at convening and catalyzing. It's just not so great at then following through and funding. Before we run out of time, I, I do want to invite people, we, we just have a little bit of time, but maybe um, let's have uh, three questions, one after the other, and then we'll answer them all together. But please make them brief so that we can, we can uh, get to a lot of people. Yes, ma'am. And I share your your views on the ability of the hippo to be able to dance with the mouse. One of the problems is that we're not supposed to lose any money. Uh, we're supposed to invest and 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 get the money back. And you mentioned you had a couple of miserable failures before you made a a, a hit winner. And I think if the process were, I would like your views on. How to uh, how to adapt that because you have to be able to l take some losses 
in order to develop cool. in entrepreneurs. Great. Yes, ma'am. Here. I'm Mitzi Wertheim. I'm not supposed to announce where I work. <laughs> Um, I think this is a global problem. I think the, the problem of not having jobs exists in the United States as well. I don't think our economists have metrics that measure it well. I mean, here in the U.S., when you use the GDP and you average it out, you don't pick up that data, so we don't understand how bad it is. I think her point about process is absolutely key. And I would argue that on the whole, nobody really understands how these processes work. And if I could make a recommendation, it would be that academics, when they explain about stuff, have to identify the story in five pages. What have you learned? So the general public can understand it. And I would also say, because these processes are so complex, they need to be illustrated because there's so many piece parts, nobody understands it. One final thing, um, Jim Clifford at Gallup has a book out called The Jobs War where he talks about this. I recommend it for everybody to read. I think it's after the environment, it's the most difficult problem we face universally, worldwide. Thank you. Can you just hand the mic to the person behind you, the gentleman? Thank you, Stephen. Um, just real quick, at the end of your book, you talk about a business plan. Um, and we've talked briefly on it. I'm just curious in your thoughts as far as how how veterans and frontline civilians who've actually served on the front lines there um, can help you scale your notion of that six by six ecosystem so that we can actually build off of that. Great. Well, let me, let me, let, let me try these three first really quickly. And, and if we have any time, we can, we can have more. But just to start with that last question, um, which, which is terribly important, and it's something I've, I've become increasingly interested in recently. Um, I think that uh, uh, when you talk about bridge populations, um, veterans are really, really interesting and um, not, ha have not been at all sufficiently utilized example of that, of a bridge population. Here are people who have lived and worked in some of the toughest, most inhospitable places on earth. They have figured out, seen, learned, observed how things actually work on the ground, what things are needed, what opportunities for new businesses there are. They have also seen and met some people who are incredible. Those are all ingredients for success in helping to create a startup. And we don't use veterans, we don't empower veterans who are interested in this, which of course is not going to be everybody. But those who are interested in this, there are some, I think, really interesting, innovative, potentially deeply impactful things we could be doing with veterans with respect to uh, startups, especially in some of these post-conflict and fragile states. Um, on the question of, um, of uh, OPIC and, and our, our need to always be um, you know, breaking even, this of course is, um, is the, the point I, 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 I hit head on with respect to the Marshall Plan. Um, you know, the, the need to quote unquote break even, um, that, that may, may still be true, but let's not look at it <clears throat> as a one year, five year, 10 year thing. Let's look at it as a 20 year, 30 year, 50 year thing. So on a 50 year basis, you know, there's no way that the investment that the United States made after the Second World War what broke even, um, you know, in the first year or two or five. Um, it broke even and returned many, many times the dividend that we, that we paid um, uh, over the subsequent years. That's point one. Point two, and this is one of the, 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 the most important objections I have to the way that the government operates now. OPIC, which, which frankly is, is, is at the top of my personal list of agencies that, are, that already exist and would be well positioned to take this on as its mission, are, are, operate under the, the, in my view, the wrong assumption that, it is, that government is not supposed to take the first loss, that government is supposed to take the same loss, i.e. no loss, 
as the private sector. So my question then is, when you look at the World Bank or, or other development institutions or other publicly funded agencies, if they are not in fact the ones that are designed to, to boldly go where no man has gone before, where no other private investor is prepared to go, then what is their purpose? Why are they here? If the private sector would do it anyway, why do we need them? So to me, the fact that OPIC um, doesn't lose money is an example that it's not working. Um, OPIC should be losing money early. It should be making money if you take a longer time horizon. But it's immediate, it, it should be going to those places that are most in need of immediate support to pave the way to make places investment ready and investable going down the road. And then the last point I'll just make on, on Mitzi's comment is I couldn't agree more. The data is, is you know, very difficult. And if you think it's bad in the United States, uh, try finding the data for Afghanistan. Mm. Um, it's, it's just virtually right. impossible. Um, I don't know if you, either of you, uh, Tara or Cameron, want to make a closing comment because I think we're just about out of time. Sure. Um, I will yield my, the last word to my colleague. I would only say on the Marshall Plan, things to, to make this entrepreneurship and peace and global impact work, for me, you need PR, not in the PR traditional sense. You need patience and risk. The patience we had with the Marshall Plan was that we would be patient for 50 years. I would argue that Greece and Turkey today need a Marshall Plan. The 50 years are over. It's up. And they both are not in great shape. So you have to be willing to take the risk and reinvest. You have to be patient, but when you have hit a point where it needs a new infusion, you gotta be there to take a bit of risk. And I guess the problem is government is risk adverse and often impatient. But you're gonna solve, you can tell us how both of those. <laughs> Well, I doubt the answers will be found in Washington. They have to be found on the ground. And I think if you want to find those answers, you have to look at the functioning parts of a society and what opportunities they offer. And I think particularly for the people who do official development assistance, I think we have to be more open to working with enterprises that make produce a surplus because if you, if a project does not over time produce a surplus, not just do a social good for someone, the local community will not take the ownership, it will not have those dynamic impacts that create more respect and demand for rule of law and democracy and freedom. And I think we have to open up our silos or maybe blow up our silos. Thank you. So let me just say in closing, um, by way of thanks, um, I, I particularly want to thank Daryl West, who runs the Governance Study, Studies Program here, who wasn't able to join us in the beginning and who was kind enough to give me um, both the home and, most importantly, encouragement um, to do this work. So thank you, Daryl. And thanks to everyone for coming today. I will be out there to talk to people, sign books, if, if you'd like to do that. And obviously would love to hear from people who are excited or interested in this kind of work. Thank you so much.